Um, I just want to let everyone know that, that uh, the people that you'll be seeing on this Zoom call are the judges for the Film Prize, which is an anomaly when you think about film festivals that, the, that are out there. It's really tearing down the wall between the filmmaker and the Film Prize judge. I also wanted to quickly uh, let people know that as of right now, Film Prize, this is only day two of uh, the Film Prize Festival. Um, and by the way, you can get tickets at prizefest.com. Go to prizefest.com and you too can see the films and judge and help, you know, create a $25,000 winner. But as of today, we have 20 states that have voted. I'm sorry, 20 states that have seen films, right? Um, internationally, we have England, Ireland, and the Netherlands who have weighed in and seen films. Also, over 3,300 of the films have been seen in the sense that they've been seen 3,300 times. 300 plus hours of watch time and ballots are already being cast, including the judges' ballots. So I'm telling you, if you're a filmmaker out there, especially if you're a film prize filmmaker, you need to connect up with these people because these are the people that are going to be your judges, but also with that audience that's out there that is a global audience. So I'm incredibly excited about what's going on with Film Prize. Also, tonight, there is a free screening, our midnight movie tonight, which is at 9 p.m., so I guess it's midnight somewhere, um, is going to be Shaun of the Dead. Um, it's super scary, so I'm not going to be watching it, but I fully expect the rest of you guys to dress up, have a few cocktails, and join us. That's 9 p.m. tonight. That's Shaun of the Dead. Go to prizefest.com. That is where the film is going to be showing for free. And then also, you can go to prizefest.com see the 20 films, vote for our $25,000 winner. And with that, I think I am through the news of the day, but I am on to the revelations of Film Prize University. And I want to bring up a very, very special, special group of people. This panel is going to focus on connecting with your audience in the year 2020. So uh, with that, I'm going to let these guys introduce themselves. I'm going to warn all of the panelists that if you are demure or humble, about your intro, I will augment it with truth and let people know how awesome you are. So you better give it all to us because that is fully expected from second one. And we will start with our friend, Jim Brunzel. Jim, intro yourself. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, it's great to be here. My name is Jim Brunzel. I am the festival director of the Music Film Art Festival Sound Unseen based in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I just also wrapped uh, the 33rd annual AGLIF, the All Genders, Lifestyles, Identities Film Festival here in Austin, Texas, where I am right now. Um, so we just went through our own virtual film festival. So I can talk a little bit about that during this panel. But uh, this is my third year as a judge juror for LA Film Prize. And it's great to be with uh, so many awesome people on this panel. Good, good, good job, Jim. Show, show him the tequila. Jim, Jim is Jim is loaded for prize bear. I love that. Uh, Paul Sloop. Thank you, Gregory. Uh, first of all, I'm a huge fan of the Louisiana Film Prize. This is also my third year. Um, I am the shorts programmer for the Cleveland International Film Festival, where I've been for 18 years. I'm the director of programming for Film Pittsburgh, where we put on several festivals, including Pittsburgh Shorts. Uh, and this past year, I did the shorts for the Cordillera International Film Festival in Reno, Tahoe, uh, as well. And that may be an ongoing thing moving forward as well. Great to be here. And definitely, definitely, definitely the best dressed man at Film Prize every single year. We, we, we love and miss you, but we're glad that you're with us today. Kimberly Browning. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kimberly Browning. Thank you for uh, inviting me back to be part of the Film Prize crew. It's one of my very, very, very favorite things to do 
every year. So um, just seeing congratulations on making it happen this way. Uh, I am the founder and festival director of Hollywood Shorts, which was LA's first short film series. We started back in 1998. We're in our 22nd year. I am the executive producer of HBO Access, which is the network's development program for episodic talent. And we have fellowships for writers and directors. And I have the honor of launching careers and helping people get their first pilot shot at HBO. And I also have the honor of working with Sharon Badal, and I am one of her associate short film programmers at the Tribeca Film Festival, which will be uh, in June in New York City next year and praying that we will be able to all be there together in person. You, you know, uh, Kimberly, I think when you say it with such fortitude, how could it not happen at that point? I'm telling you, you know, so if there's any festival that has such a legacy of rising from the ashes, um, Tribeca is it. So I hope that it'll be, you know, one of the festivals that'll help us kind of all get back on our feet. Yeah, yeah. And I will tell you that what Kimberly did leave out is I was at South by Southwest, I think two years ago. And I would talk about, talk about a woman that knows everyone. I mean, if you want to be in the center of the party, stand next to Kimberly Browning. And I swear to God, it is incredible, the, the, the nest of activity that was happening down there around you. Just because so I'm old. Just because I'm old. <laughs> Just a survival. I, th I think it's old and that you've stayed in Los Angeles as long as you have. <laughs> you, get, you get like it's a medal. True. At some point, everybody passes by the corner of Hollywood and Vine. I love that Greg was the very first person I saw the minute I got off the airplane, walked to convention center, looking for the line to pick up my credentials, and Kallenberg was the first face I saw. So we knew we were going to have a really, really, really kick-ass time, which we 100 percent, 100 percent. John Wildman, tell them about yourself. Uh, I am the uh, I'm the publicist uh, for Film Prize, uh, as well as about 20 film festivals across the country um, as uh, part of Wild Works PR, uh, the editor uh, in chief for FilmsGoneWild.com, which uh, covers films and film festivals and a filmmaker as well. Well, um, I got to tell you, this is a stellar panel to tackle something that is incredibly um, difficult out there, especially with the way the world changed, the way it changed so fast. I, I'd like to start by just throwing out the question, if we could kind of just go back in our time machine and think about what the world was like before, just so that we could set a foundation, just to talk about how much it's changed. What, what was it like getting your film out before and how in the past did you connect with audiences? Um, well, I'll, I'll start because I ha made a film and, and had to put it out and, uh, and, you know, and I would say actually, um, it's, it wasn't that different than what it will be now going forward as far as, um, uh, you know, doing a film festival tour with the film, uh, utilizing that uh, to, to get interest and kind of seed audiences across the country and then doing a VOD release and, uh, and managing that release. And, uh, and I mean, this is you know, something we're going to get into. Um, but, uh, you know, frankly, you know, since I did not do a theatrical release with my film and went strictly to, uh, straight to VOD, I think that's what many more filmmakers are going to be doing going forward as they have been in the past two or three years. Does somebody uh, like want to add a few things? And I'm kind of curious also, I mean, the, the power and, you know, there, there, there's a, a, the, the connective idea of being in a theater was was that important back then or have we as as john noted uh started to move towards like online being the thing i i, I know in cleveland we were uh the rug got pulled out from us about 12 days before the festival because we were going we're going to be alive we're going to do our thing and then south by southwest canceled they had big numbers there that we weren't seeing yet uh and then 12 days before our festival the city basically said, we're shutting down the city, and that included us. What that turned into, immediately we thought we were going to lose our festival completely. Uh, we ended up pivoting and going completely online. And I think I, I said all that to preface that, that while everybody was terrified at the beginning, there was a silver lining in this. We got at a festival that gets 106,000 in attendance. We had a thousand new members sign up for our organization online. And so we discovered there's a whole audience that can be served 
service through virtual offerings that you're not reaching because they're not going to come to downtown Cleveland or they're for, they're just far enough away that that's not convenient. Um, so it definitely shifted us to we we can't wait to get back to in person. There's nothing like it. You get that community vibe. You get to be in the same room with an audience and feel the response. Um, but having said that, we're always going to have a virtual element running alongside our festival that will offer greater access to some of the programming we have available so that we can reach that audience that will not be there. And that's something we probably would not have discovered for some time if we weren't forced to uh, due to this pandemic. So to us, that's the silver lining. But every other aspect of the question you're asking is, much like John said, it's really the same. You're still submitting from, from the festival perspective, you're still submitting to us. It's just how will we get to share your film? Will we be doing stuff like this? Will we be doing Q and A's online in Zoom chat rooms uh, and showing your film virtually? Or will we? when will we finally get you back in person? And by the way, we can't wait to do that. Yeah, and, and, and let's talk a bit about that shift with the pandemic because it, you know, it wasn't just a, a tiny shift like, you know, a, a, you know, God forbid, a, something like a Hurricane Katrina going through a city. This was something that we all experienced. You know, Kimberly, you're in Los Angeles um, that really talk about a place that took it very seriously at the very beginning. It was a tectonic shift. What, what was that shift like? And, you know, again, was there that real transition that's a lasting transition that will take us online forever or, you know? Yeah. Working yeah. Or? I think for us, because, um, because of our leadership, it was from the beginning and everybody was pretty on board except for small enclaves. But generally speaking, um, I think the difference was in the beginning, we really didn't expect we expected everybody to kind of fall in, in that same kind of uh, approach to trying to attack the challenge. And so we were like, great, we'll do this. We'll get down. And in, you know, 60 days, we can get back. So I think in our minds, everybody was like, yeah, no problem. We'll all do our stuff and do our festivals and do our productions in the summer. Great. I really said, so I'm going to miss my friends. And it was obviously heartbreaking when Trebekah um, had to pivot, but it was like, no problem, I'll see everybody in the summer. Uh, and so when that ended up not happening, I think, I think that was the biggest change, Greg, but I do think something that's gonna be long lasting that I think is really beneficial for all of us as filmmakers is that the business side of film has finally kind of caught up and had to adapt. And so you have buyers and you have licensors and you have media that before wouldn't cover medium festivals, festivals that were doing more digital campaigns um, and really focused on the kind of the top, top big, big brand name festivals to, to catch up with the demand that they all of a sudden needed they had to come to all of us in however we were showing it. So for them to kind of finally get on board with the digital aspect of this business, that will never go back. So there are buyers that you would never ever have had sign on to some of these websites to watch a film ever. And now that's how they're all doing it. And, and, and finally getting on board with making offers. Um, we have a featured doc that we have been we decided to release during COVID and it's been the most beautiful thing to share our art film. And we have a plethora of wonderful competitive distributors really interested in our film. I don't know if we would have had it not been in this paradigm. You know, you know, it's interesting because this actually came out of uh, one of our, our startup uh, prize aspects of what we do. We do a lot here, of course, at the prize foundation where um, there was this, uh, remark made that that said that this was really jettisoning us to a future that was inevitable in a sense. Um, you know, John, you, you as you said, you sort of deal in this world where you're kind of living on both sides of, of the same coin in the sense that you're a filmmaker. You deal with a lot of film festivals. Everybody ran online to do what Kimberly and, and Paul have all done. Um, I'm just curious, you know, good thing, bad thing, like the, 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 what is the current sort of status of these these people that have 
um, all of a sudden either found their, their voice online, found their festivals online. What is going on out there right now? What's the current status? Well, um, uh, one, let me give a, 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 shout, a quick shout out to, to Paul and Team Cleveland because they were incredibly successful and, and early on. They were, they were one of the first fests to make that pivot um, along with Melanie Addington, our, 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 our good friend at Oxford Film Festival and San Luis Obispo. And one of the things that the, those film festivals did uh, through the Film Festival Alliance is that week in and week out, they were having these conversations with all these film festivals across the country, basically going over what was working and what was not working. And so each subsequent festival was able to adapt and able to innovate as they were going along. So by the time we reached the summer, people uh, in a lot of ways had the online thing down and then they started adding the drive-in component and that hybrid component. Now I would say for the filmmakers, and because you know, I also see we're getting uh, you know questions from you know from from our filmmakers on like well, well what do we do and how how do we go you know go about this I think what we're going to see going forward is that more film festivals are 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 going to be doing um, one the virtual thing is not going to go away and you know and and so I think like you know with Film Prize like the amazing success that we've seen with Film Prize with a global audience where before you had to make that trip to Shreveport um, to, to, you know, to see the films. I don't think film festivals are gonna give that up so quickly. Now, mind you, they're geo-blocking to a state um, for, because, for feature films um, for business reasons, but they're not gonna give that up. And I think the other thing you're gonna see for filmmakers is that more and more, you're gonna see film festivals do revenue sharing and also um, they're gonna be um, uh, you know, paying screening fees where before, um, screening fees just went to studio films or majors like A24, Neon, and I think you're going to see uh, more of our submitted films from feature filmmakers are actually going to start getting uh, screening fees as well. So that symbiotic relationship between uh, film festivals and films that, you know, in a lot of ways, film price has been so ahead of the curve on, I think you're going to see other film festivals really embracing that even more so. So I'm actually... You know, I'm, I'm, I, I was talking to a reporter from Variety two days ago, and he's like going, everybody else is doomsaying, and you're the one, and you know, and you're one of the few people that are like going, no, there's a lot of positives here, because there are a lot of positives if you're a business person as well as a filmmaker. Yeah, and, and you know, again, speaking uh, specifically to like, you know, those filmmakers out there, you know, I mean, Paul, like, and again, you, you were very ahead of the curve when, when the time came and you guys made that very quick pivot with Cleveland. I'm curious how you're feeling with like every film festival out there now sort of like crowding the marketplace. I mean, you know, again, I mean, I'm not, I think that John is absolutely correct, but at the same time, I mean, how do you sort of differentiate yourself especially for the filmmakers out there. The filmmakers are really looking to each one of you guys there to sort of lift them up into a light. How do you do that now? As you know, like John said, if the world's going to the internet. You know, the internet's not, not uh, for lack of film festivals right now. I would definitely say that. Right, and, and, and I, to one of the points John made was, I think that's where a lot of the geo-blocking has come in. I think as much as anything, it's to protect a festival run because if every festival can play it to everybody, then I've already seen the film. I don't want to see the lineup that Cleveland has because LA Film Festival played it and they played it to the whole nation or to the whole. So, you know, that's part of the reason behind the geo-blocking and trying to make sure that it makes sense. The other aspect of that, that and why that works hand in hand is that all of our festivals, especially those of us that have been around for a long time and have a built-in audience that's connected to us, we're the marketing tool for the film. We're the connection to make people aware that we're, you know, we're going to have the film and show it. So we get an immediate warm contact with our lineup to, to send them the lineup uh, and show them what we're going to play. Uh, so I think that that's how we stand out, so to speak. We have our own audience already. Um, and that's why geo blocking is important. The other thing is, you know, we're in Cleveland in particular, constantly looking for, okay, what can we do if we're forced to be virtual one more year to make it as much like being at our festival as possible. And there's a bunch of things that we're doing behind the scenes to make it uh, even more uh, like a physical in-person festival, some special events and that that we're planning um, for just that purpose. 
uh, and that it matches what we do at our festival, things that don't happen the same way at other festivals. And I think that's an important aspect that all festivals are trying to do. Um, but, but we're all beholden to that. We, we really need to some degree uh, everybody to go along with this idea of geo-blocking, but also with the idea that we're not paying for venues now and the cost is much lower. So that to John's other point is why it does start to make sense because not all of our dollars have to go to what it takes to lock down a theater or 12 screens like we do in Cleveland on a whole venue. It makes it more possible to say, okay, well, instead we can revenue share with the films. And now it's a positive for filmmakers too. It's not the negative that it might've felt like when this first happened and oh, now they're only gonna stream my film. Oh, wait, I'm gonna get a paycheck too. Okay, this, this might work after all. Give it. Give us twenty seconds on what geo blocking is. Okay, so in Cleveland we did it different because we were so early. We didn't have some of the things that have been figured out since then. What we had to do is use the the way that you purchased your pass. Your card had to be have an Ohio address billing oh address for it. Okay, so we were. That's how we geo blocked Ohio. If you didn't have a credit card with an Ohio billing address, you could not buy a pass and come see our our films. Now the platforms are sophisticated enough for you to be able to use the zip codes or the state. Those platforms can actually geo block for you. Um, in Pittsburgh, we're using Eventive for our festival in November. Uh, and so like while short films will be available much more widely for feature films, it'll be the tri-state area. Pittsburgh's way too Southwest to make any sense to be Pennsylvania because Philadelphia is not part of our audience, but across the border in West Virginia and Ohio is. So we're doing a regional geo block of that three straight state area. But it basically it just limits the access for your viewers to whatever the defined area is that you agree with. And that can change from one film to another. One film may want Pittsburgh only. Except so, 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 and, and I just can I add to that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I think it's yes. and, and just the, the one thing I was going to do that I was just going to clarify just for the filmmakers, because of course we're all sort of yeah. festival programmers that are here. The for the filmmakers, the the advantage that Paul is talking about is if you're playing in Cleveland, that that actually now has worth and value and heft because the people in Cleveland are going to be able to see it for the Cleveland International Film Festival. And then in New York, they're going to be able to see it for the New York Film Festival or whatever it is that you'll be playing. Uh, go ahead and add. Uh, yeah, so it's really follow. important for our feature filmmakers to, to understand that part of the evolution of distributors and buyers and licensors has been finding a way that they can maintain the integrity of the films that they're going to pick up and what's premium value to them. And so these are these standards that we as festivals are all kind of coming to also are informed by the distributors and what they're comfortable with. So when you are thinking about feature festivals to submit your film to, make sure they're on a good platform like Festive um, and uh, and geocaching is sometimes the term that you use or geofencing. One of the reasons you want to do that also is you, uh, that works really well in addition to what's called a ticket cap, which means if you let, if you're going to accept the screening from the festival, you need to make sure that they have that region so that your film remains interesting to festivals in other regions. But also you want to make sure to limit the amount of people who can see it just like we would be at a Shreveport facility that only had two or 300 Distributors are not going to be interested in your film if 20 festivals have played it and it was um, unfettered and now thousands and thousands of people have already seen it and they don't feel like they're going to get those monies back in the investment of your film. Sorry. To, to, to Kim's point, really, like we're just in the midst of putting all our features together for the Three Rivers Film Festival in Pittsburgh. And for each film, you're basically coming to terms on three different issues. What's the geo blocking? What's the ticket cap? And what's the availability window for the film? Is it a specific screening time? Is it a 24 hour window or is it VOD for the run of your festival? And you can use those different numbers to manage it. Okay, we'll allow for 500 tickets, but we want it in a 24 hour window. So we'll give you a bigger number because if you can get 500 people in one day to watch it, great. Where others say 300 is fine and you can show it for the whole festival because you're only gonna sell 300 tickets max. So you have those three things. What space, what geo area are you going to allow to see it? How many tickets and what will be the open window of viewing opportunity? You know, uh, Jim, Jim, you do something that is pretty specialized with Sound Unseen. 
um, listening to sort of like what the world is having to do to accommodate for a pandemic and this idea of sort of geoblocking and all the things that that we are having to do to adjust who we are and what we're supposed to do. And, and just to be clear, Film Prize is a global ungeoblocked festival because the world is going to be judging these films and hopefully handling, I shouldn't say hopefully, will be handing one of these film, filmmakers $25,000 cash. I'm curious, with something like Sound Unseen, does this change the way you think strategically about what you do? Um, yeah, I mean, sure, to some degree. I mean, to go back, though, to your original question, I do want to point out I mean, earlier this year in 2020, myself, John, Kimberly, and Paul, we had gone to the Sundance Film Festival in person. I had gone to the Berlin International Film Festival. And by the time I got back from Berlin in late February and coming over in March, that's when the talk of, you know, this pandemic is on the rise, what our festival is gonna do. And also being on the ground here in Austin, I can confidently say South by Southwest was going to happen. It was the yeah. city that shut it yeah. down, not the festival. It was the city of Austin. That's right. If that festival would have happened in a global pandemic, they would have been done forever. And the fact that they waited until the city did that, I mean, you know, and then they didn't have any type of backup plan. There was all of this, um, you know, kerfuffle of, you know, employees and staff and layoffs. And, you know, the future of that festival is in jeopardy. Now they have come out and said that they are going to be virtual uh, in March, 2021. So I just wanted to preference that real quick. Um, and it, it was at that point, because to Paul's point, Cleveland was going to be in person. And the fact that they turned that around in two or three weeks to make that virtual, I mean, kudos to Paul and the rest of Cleveland. I mean, the fact that they were able to pull it off and then you had major festivals just flat out cancel, they are going to be under the microscope even more for their members, for their patrons, for filmmakers to make sure that they happen next year. So the fact that all these other festivals are planning virtual or hybrid, and we're only talking about the United States here. Gregory, you just said that Film Prize is global. I mean, Venice in September happened and they had an in-person festival. So it seems like only in the United States and maybe even North America where virtual is sort of 100% moving forward, yet everywhere else in the world, it is being sort of a hybrid or in-person as well. So I yeah, Jim, I'll say that um, I have a film about to play at Raydance. And when we got in, they were saying it was gonna be hybrid and now that outbreaks are happening they're now kind of pulling back on that and kind of you're starting to hear that well we're probably just going to do virtual so I do think we're seeing more of a rise in that internationally but for the guys in New Zealand yeah they're good to go yeah so, yeah of course and so I mean to your to your uh question now Gregory about sound and scene um I mean I was sort of in a a great position because with a glyph we were in August and we had made the decision shortly after South by um, like late March, early April to go virtual. So since we made that uh, virtual for Aglyph, it was pretty easy to just go and talk to Sound Unseen. And, um, you know, for transparency, John Wildman's also our publicist for Sound Unseen. Um, you know, we wanted to be virtual, but the interesting point that we're doing and to go back to geoblocking and geofencing is because it is going to be virtual. Um, and I am in Austin, Texas right now. We are going to geoblock to Minnesota and Texas for Sound Unseen, which is the first time we've ever done anything like that. Because for these in person festivals like Film Prize, like Cleveland, like Hollywood Shirts, you have to be there on the ground to attend. So the fact that you can geoblock to a zip code, to a county, to a state, to North America, to the US is pretty incredible. And you just have to convey that to filmmakers, to producers, to artists, and just tell them what your plans are. And if they're comfortable working with you, great. But some people are also gonna you know, be resistant to that because imagine being a filmmaker and working on something two or three years, and you're gonna have your big premiere in 2020, and all the festivals are 
you know, virtual. So you can't attend, you can't have a quote unquote in-person world premiere. And some filmmakers and producers have opted not to play their films in a virtual setting. And that's absolutely 100% their choice, in my opinion. Um, so with Sound Unseen, we are giving people the option. We have made it very clear that we want certain films and it is gonna be virtual. And if they don't wanna play with us, you know, there's always next year and we'll have a plan. Um, whether if it is hybrid, whether if it's virtual, I mean, I'm not planning on any type of in-person until there's a vaccine, period. So, so I, I want to get back to you, uh, Kimberly, because you're, again, another one that is a, a filmmaker and also somebody that, that, that runs a festival in Los Angeles, California. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and, and, um, and uh, just so that everyone knows who's out there, we are getting your questions. We'll be uh, probably getting to them in the next uh, couple of moments. But um, I, I do want to ask another filmmaker and festival programmer, is it amenable? I mean, again, before we get into this idea of like their, their, the festivals are online and whether they're geo-blocking or not, we've heard the word compensation thrown out there. Um, you're a filmmaker. You've, you've spent your money making a film. You are going to be basically not able to have the premiere that you wanted to have or to play at a major festival, which some might argue right now that Tribeca and Toronto and some of the regional film festivals, they're, it's all on equal a playing field at this point. I'm curious, you as a filmmaker, when you hear compensation, you hear these festivals, what what matters to you now as a yeah. filmmaker who's spending money out there? Yeah, so what's important to us is um, building our, our relationship and with our audiences that will potentially um, come and hopefully rent or buy the film when it has its digital release down the road. So as we're evaluating festivals, we are prioritizing, I don't care about licensing fees. Most festivals can't afford it. And even with this pivot, most festivals do not pay licensing or um, um, screening fees. That's just, you know, and so that's not a do or die for us. What's more important for us is that by the time we spend these months sharing the film virtually or in person that we have um, really, we're really connecting with the people who are gonna be our street team and the people who are already celebrating our film. We're already getting so many um, solicitations and inquiries because the word of mouth is building so hard for our film already. That is what's really powerful for us is so that down the line, in 2021, when we're ready to either Amazon or Netflix or wherever our our you know baby is going to get to live, where people can buy it or rent it, that we have the ability to be as effective with finding our audience as possible. So whether I'm doing a digital screening at um, again, like you said, Greg, one of the interesting things about COVID has been it's been the great equalizer. In the beginning, none of us knew nothing. And we all have been on this journey together on the festival side, learning how to figure out a way to build a stage that we can continue our mission to support filmmakers. And so as a filmmaker benefiting from that same exercise, what's been really important for us is just like in the before time, there are festivals that do a great job and are there for you as a filmmaker and want to facilitate you building a team and a coalition that's going to support your film going to the world. And then there are festivals that aren't. And one of the, what I have found illuminating is uh, the consistency with which a lot of the festivals that maybe don't really have their act together or are also not doing a good job in pivoting or not being responsible and not communicating to filmmakers as a transition. And, uh, and that's been most important to us is to make sure that we're building relationships and allowing our film to go to those festivals that like in real life in the virtual space is extremely responsible and is doing everything they can to a protect our film. And, um, you know, there is talk of a festival on the East coast that if, if, they're, if the films get in, they plan on charging the filmmakers an additional fee to pay for like the, DR, <laughs> the DRM fees and stuff, right? And that information was put 
in their film freeway. And so these kind of things, young filmmakers, first time, second time filmmakers, and then virtual being brand new and a whole new vocabulary, um, that's been what's most important to us is to root out these festivals and to really prioritize the fests that are um, going to help me sell my film down the road. And, 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 and let's stick on the word. Uh, it's if, if we were doing a drinking game where the word virtual was where you took shots, we'd all be uh, smashed at this point. Um, I would tell you, right, there you go. Everyone has I'm their ready. glasses. I love it. But, you know, um, there is a lot of noise out there. And I don't I don't want us all to kid ourselves. I mean, we had, a you know, an uphill climb. We've been very lucky right now because film prizes is, is it's a game. You know, you watch the films, you get to choose a twenty five thousand dollar winner. Um, I'm curious from the perspective of the filmmaker who is basically seeing, you know, again, all of you guys have taken your festivals online. There's a lot of noise out there. How do you, how do you cut through that noise and how do you sort of make a mark for yourself, whether that be an artistic mark or a financial mark? Um, what, what is the road ahead or what is the road you're seeing that could be ahead that could help these filmmakers who are watching this now, one, get their film seen and two, hopefully get compensated for it. I love the silence. <laughs> it's it's it is it's a quandary. I, I'm I'm curious where people, you know, again, there are people even for film prize who are spending tens of thousands of dollars to make a film. And again, they have the chance of winning twenty five thousand. And next year, hopefully, we go back to fifty thousand. Um, but I am curious what your opinion is, you know, both as a filmmaker or a festival programmer, just as somebody who is a lover of the craft how these filmmakers out there cut through a world where every film festival is online. Geo-blocked or not, it is not hard to see a movie online these days. So how do these filmmakers really take advantage of the opportunities that are there and amplify it to, 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 to help them with, with the work that they've, they've worked very hard to, to produce? Okay, let me start. Um, you know, again, you know, when, when you're talking about, uh, you know, film festivals, you know, you know, some offer a lot of hoopla and fanfare. Um, some offer um, some big cash prizes. Some offer uh, some awesome parties, what, what have you. But ultimately, it comes down to the curating. And, 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 that, and that especially is amplified when we are um, going virtual. Because you know, what, what a Rachel Morgan uh, programs at um, Sidewalk you know, is a, a, a different personality than what a Melanie Addington programs at Oxford, or what a Shannon Franklin programs at Naples, or you know, or you know, and you can just go down the list. And so, as a filmmaker, again, this goes to your independence as a filmmaker, and it goes to mapping out your own strategy, and and you know, and not just carpet bombing uh, film freeway because who has money to do that with submission fees, but to actually go through and go, yeah, you know, something I think Cleveland is going to be really, really important to me for a lot of obvious reasons. So, so I definitely want to submit to them. Or right, same thing with Nashville, same thing with uh, Indie Memphis, you know, or, or, or what have you. And, you know, and some, you know, you go, listen, some really are highlighting um, LGBTQIA plus uh, programming. Some are really highlighting uh, horror films. Some are really highlighting, uh, uh, you know, the work of people of color or female filmmakers. Um, you know, and so those are I'm gonna work on or, or documentaries versus narrative. And it's just being educated. And it's just going at with a with a really smart strategy um, based on what you want. That's the thing here is that you know our sense of of what we consider success. You know, success isn't always you know a, a cliche three picture deal um, at, at a studio now. Success can be being able to make the next movie the next year or you know or or in a couple of years. And so that's up to us to decide what we decide is, is success. Well, you, you know, I'm sure. I'm gonna throw this back to uh to, to to kimberly who again you know when you start going into your savings account i mean that sounds awesome um but at the at the end of the day um you know again it's not hard to find a movie online to watch or stream yeah. these days and i'm just kind of curious sure. from the filmmaking perspective like is that the that the decision making tree that you go through um i think i'd like to offer that one of the Great things is there's been just like normally we'd all be in Shreveport right now and so I wouldn't be able to visit the other four festivals I'm intending on participating in this weekend and just like that 
the general public, the civilians, the non cinephiles are finding our festivals. One of the things I have found really effective for me along the years is finding ways to connect with non film audiences and to go outside of the choir that's already in the church and to find ways through social media and through collaborations with regional organizations and NGOs to really identify the audience and the subject matter of my film and what is that hook and how can I share and engage audiences that are interested in the subject matter as opposed to people who are already inclined to come to festivals. That process has been even more effective because now I can reach people in their homes. I'm not asking them to go to the Arclight or go to the Lemley's to go to the Indian Film Festival where they normally wouldn't. And so the film that we have right now is about jazz dance. So it's been really great because we feature a lot of really high profile people from the history and rich legacy of jazz dance, which is very specific cult community, right? And so being able to really hook on to people that care about dance and um, we're not focusing on it's really, and, and Wildman, I hope, will speak to this. It's really difficult right now for features to get the attention of, um, of reviewers if you are at a regional fest that's at virtual. It's really hard to get covered right now. But I've avoided the film critics, and we've been sending our information and trying to get covered by people who cover that subject matter in a non-film. So we're not going for coverage in entertainment sections. We're going for sociological or social justice, mm -hmm. or health, you know, who are those editors and bloggers and reporters in the non-film space? I don't give a shit about um, getting a good review from another film that I have featured that's about to come out is a narrative rock star dealing with mm, addiction. And so we are focusing our campaign on festivals and then promoting our festivals uh, music bloggers and recovery centers and people who deal with youth and addiction. And we're building such a great response because we're not trying to fight for that one guy at the Times to watch one of the thousands of things that's in his inbox, which you're speaking to. They're less inclined um, and it's really, really hard right now to get them to care, especially for the, like the Awareness Film Festival opens this week and this great film's gonna premiere called I Heard Sarah. And so our whole campaign has been focused on non-film entities, the people who care about addiction, people who work in the space, people who have recovered. And we are focusing our festival run on those kind of niche festivals that focus there as well. And that's really been effective for us and really, um, I think a lot of filmmakers would be would benefit from thinking outside the box a little bit, particularly for features, because there's so much access. And every festival from March through July is now figuring out how to all happen before December, right? And there's always gonna be so many more festivals every weekend. And how can you break through is to get outside of our circle and find the people who are down the road, the people who are gonna search on Netflix. What are those keywords that somebody would find your film on Netflix? They should be identifiers and informational and how you need to find those organizations that are already speaking to like Sky. My friend Sky has a film about, um, she interviewed like 40 people over the age of 70 and it's this beautiful documentary. So she teamed up with the AARP and they hosted a screening for her virtually. And they have like 16,000 people sign up to get a ticket to watch her film, right? That would never happen. So she went right to her audience and didn't worry about traditional industry promotional concepts. Yeah, I, I love that. Is that I helpful? No, it's it's definitely helpful because, you know, again, you got to get beyond the festival. There is there is no doubt these days. And that is great uh, that you just put light on that path. We're going to go to uh, the audience questions. And it, this is a great one uh, from Hannah Dorsett. She's the director of Becky's Big Catch. And she is asking um, how you gauge a virtual audience's response to your film. Yeah. 
Anybody want to take that one? I mean, it's, 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 this is, this is what we're missing. I mean, I, I had thought coming into this, I'm like, okay, so one of the, why we miss in person so much is, you know, if we were there at film prize, we'd be watching the yeah. films with an audience. And that has a totally different, it's a totally different experience of a film. I mean, yes, I watch a lot of films, thousands of films every year by myself, but the, experiences I appreciate the most are going to places like Film Prize and film festivals and being able to sit with an audience and get a true take on how an audience is going to respond. Because we don't typically re program for virtual people watching by themselves. You program for a group of people in a room watching. Um, I think all of us, all we're getting now is opportunities to gab, grab ballots from audiences and see what they thought of the film. But I'm still affected by the fact that, but that's still them watching by themselves. And so many of these films aren't getting that, you know, I, I wanna use one example because it goes back to your other question. You know, there was a film for Cleveland last year that was going to launch at Cleveland. It was going to get to play Cleveland and Tribeca as its first two festivals. And obviously that meant they also fell in that time frame where the world collapsed right as their film was going to release. Are you talking about piece of cake? I'm talking about piece of cake. And they were like, what yeah, we don't, we don't think we can do it. And I actually said, to them, I don't think you should either because at that point we all thought you can have a big release at an in-person festival in the summer. You'll still be able to do Tribeca in their delayed version. So even though Cleveland was gonna go virtual, I said to them, yes, save it. I guarantee, I'm guarantee you right now, we will give your film a slot for next year. We'll just wait to play the film because I want to show it in person too. So there's no, I don't think there's, we can all sit here and say how to gauge it. There might be creative ways, can but I, it's not going to be the same. Yeah, I might be able to offer a couple of ideas. Um, I really encourage everybody to be much more proactive. So at the end of your um, uh, H264 that you send to the festival, and a lot of you are already putting your websites at the end, put more of a vibrant call to action, have a destination where, thank you for watching our film, please come to our website and let us know what you thought. Put it right there on your film, right where you put your, the, like when you get your end credit and that last card and then have your website literally put on there, please come by the website and let us know what you know. Have destinations in your social media that literally has this call to action and have a destination that's an engaging place for people in your Facebook page for your film. It's a little tougher on Instagram. So using some legacy products might benefit you in this space. Have a place on your website um, that people can come and share what they thought of your film and make sure that that's part of your engagement. So when you are inviting people and doing postings with the link for people to watch your film on the festival's website, on there say, please come to this destination afterwards. Maybe you could have some sort of, you know, incitement to do that. But if you tell people to do it, that will actually activate more activity to people giving you feedback. Um, because, you know, the room, it's, you're not necessarily gonna get those emails from the festival. Um, some festivals are engaging more feedback so even if you get 20 to 30% of responses, it could still be helpful if you sold 300 tickets. Um, but as filmmakers, you got to tell people what you need and just put it on your film, put it on your social media, tell people to come tell you, call you, email you, let people know how to reach you and they'll let you know if they are touched by your film. Um, uh, I, and again, another uh, a question from uh, one of the uh, directors in the audience from Film Prize, Christine Chin from Vue. Um, really almost like a broader question and, and we'll, let's try to get through it quickly so we can get through a couple more questions. But the um, idea of distribution in the year 2020, um, short films, better market, worse market, um, also on the feature side, um, are people out there actually buying things? I've, I've heard that the rates have certainly come down considerably because of all the, the products that, that's out there, but, but what is that market for sort of redeeming some of that investment in those films, whether it be a short or a feature going forward? I mean, John, I think that it, one? it sort are, of depends you? on, uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but it, like the topic, you know, because I mean, things in 2020 that are more urgent, there might be a more active um, buyer or distributor to put that out uh, versus something that can wait another year or two. 
And so even like looking at some of the films that were submitted for sound and scene for Aglyph, once we told people that we were going virtual, you know, for the most part, I think we only had, you know, three or four filmmakers that said, oh, I've already signed with a distributor and they don't want me playing virtual. So, you know, and I mean, that's something that you have to honor, but I think a lot, a, a lot of what's happening with distribution and especially in short films is, yeah, they're looking at it sort of what John was saying before, studios aren't necessarily attaching themselves to a filmmaker and be like, okay, we wanna sign you to the three picture deal. But if they see a short that they really want, they may, you know, purchase that short and work with that filmmaker on someone else's script for them to direct. So, I mean, there's still plenty of distribution opportunities in 2020, but I think it, it, it does matter on sort of the subject or, you know, the narrative and how timely it is because there is a ton of content out there, as we all know, from the majors of Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, and they are really snapping up a lot of these uh, films. And they're sort of putting filmmakers and producers, you know, in, I don't want to say a hostage situation, but they're sort of telling them, if you play festivals, then any offer that we have for you is off the table. So they have to weigh what's better for them in order if they want that distribution deal or if they want to forge ahead and play the fast circuit. Yeah. And so uh, we've got uh, two more questions and then we're going to be uh, heading into the uh, shorts into features conversation that will be moderated by Chris Lyon. Um, this one's coming from Ben Ash. He is uh, one of the filmmakers from the film Imminent. Um, he has an um, African-American director and African-American lead actor. Um, do we lean into festivals that promote diversity? That is the question. And again, it, that can be a, a broader question too about sort of, you guys talked about genres, the importance of genres and, you know, being very particular about where you put your film in a festival or where you maybe get it distributed. But I'm, I'm asking that question for our friend, Ben. I, uh, I actually answered this uh, on, online, but I want to say for everybody in that, you know, uh, for sci-fi thriller, for genre stuff, you don't want to limit yourself. Um, to, you know, to, to just those fests. Yes, you definitely want to make that a solid part of your strategy, but many mainstream fests, so to speak, mainstream fests regional-wise, are programming genre stuff more and more and more. And the reason why is because uh, they're also desperate to get younger audiences, and younger audiences respond to genre films more and more and more. Um, and then the last part of that, um, yeah, you definitely want to target those fests that uh, feature and focus uh, films by and, um, and, and featuring people of color. Uh, you definitely want to make that a solid part of your strategy as well. You know, if, if, that's, if that is a main part of, of your film, then you utilize it. You work that. Yeah, and for the uh, final question, this question has come across quite a few times because the Film Prize filmmakers are, are out there. They are apparently watching. They are a part of this in a big way. Um, but before we ask this question, now that I have all the filmmakers on there, I'm going to tell all the Film Prize filmmakers out there, remember, people are watching your films right now. Send everyone to prizefest.com. This thing is wide open. It's day two of the festival. As I said before, the films have been seen over 3,300 times in basically one day, which is crazy and awesome. And we appreciate um, all of you filmmakers that are watching this now because this is the question. This is the golden question. And we'll let you guys sort of take us out on this. Um, <laughs> and it has nothing to do with uh, connecting with an audience. Um, and it has everything to do with connecting with you. What do judges like? What are you considering as you watch these films at Film Prize to pick your winner? And I'll start with you, Paul. Great story and the full package. I mean, the, the person who gets it most right, but in the end, the story is the most important. Story is always king. I know in, in the process of selecting films and I come to uh, Film Prize and vote under the same guys, the film that I would most likely wanna play at my festival is the one that's going to get my vote. And that's going to be the film that's the strongest in all ways, but in the end, it's story first, it rules the day. Love it, love it. Jim, Jim Brunzel. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would agree with Paul. Um, originality, um, if it's entertaining, um, there's nothing wrong with educating an audience, especially if it's something new. Um, yeah, production value, you know, the, the, the whole package. But, you know, all, all of us are going to have different 
needs and wants from films. So I can't speak for everyone, but yeah, you're asking the question from me. And yeah, I would say originality, if it's entertaining, um, if I would share this film with other people, if I would tell people about this film. So it's gotta be memorable as well. I love this because these are really cautionary tales on a bigger level as to what makes a good film and what is going to connect with an audience. Kimberly Browning, our last judge that's on this yeah. panel, uh, uh, take us out with uh, some wisdom. Yeah. Uh, for me, I love a film that really embraces the challenge of film prize. And so if that film has an unexpected moment and really embraces the town and the region of Shreveport and there's a character in there. I also um, love to celebrate um, operatic performances. It's such a joy to meet so many actors, especially being from here in LA. And so when an actor's performance elevates and embraces the story and really takes us on a journey, um, unapologetically, those are the films that score highest for me and that really celebrate the region and could not have been made anywhere else but Shreveport, anywhere else but Louisiana. To me, that's what Prize Fest is about. That's why it's the largest. Like that person needs to get their ass back here and make another movie. That is where I find my my uh, scores go to who's going to best be a steward of that money and and um, and and expand and learn and grow. This is such so very, very, very beautifully put by all of you. I want to thank Paul Sloop, John Wildman, Kimberly Browning, and of course, Jim Brunsell. Thank you guys so much. This has been an incredible kickoff to Film Prize University. We'll be here right after this with Chris Line uh, tapping in. And then uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m., we're going to be here again with free panels for filmmakers from all over the world to hear the wisdom from our Film Prize judges and the people who are associated with us here in the Film Prize family. That's you, John. Thank you guys so much. You guys were absolutely amazing. Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to the Film Prize panel discussions with our festival judges and film experts. Thank you so much for joining us. I know that there are a lot of uh, filmmakers that are out there that are uh, watching who are a part of Film Prize and then those who are not so much a part of the direct festival. Sorry, some like a motorcycle rally going on downtown Shreveport. Um, so I've got with me uh, three fantastic participants and I wanted to take a moment to introduce each of them to you or at least rather have them introduce themselves to you. So we'll start off with Jennifer. Jennifer uh, uh, Weberly, why don't you give us a start? 
Hi, my name is Jennifer Weberly. I'm an independent um, film producer and editor. I make um, largely under $500,000 films. And uh, we've currently in post-production on one and we have two others in distribution. Fantastic, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen Prince. Hi, nice to be with you. I'm Jen Prince. I'm a producer, director, um, occasionally editor also. <laughs> and um, I'm in the indie world. I'm based out of Los Angeles and I'm also a film educator. I teach directing. Fantastic, thank you so much for joining us, Milan. Good to be back, third year in a row. Uh, Look at this I'm wonderful a, beard. I'm a producer and executive producer, uh, formerly used to be in production finance and accounting at Warner Brothers. Uh, some films like uh, My Friend Dahmer and Assassination Nation and Plus One, and more recently on the festival circuit, uh, The Killing of Kenneth Chamberlain and, uh, oh, which, which, which one? Oh, The Dark and the Wicked that just was, was premiered at Tribeca and then uh, virtually premiered at Fantasia. It's coming out November 6th. Fantastic. Um, I am so excited that you guys are here. We're going to be talking about the, the process and the uh, challenge of moving from someone who's making short films to making feature films. Um, and so I wanted to start off if, if maybe each of you could help us by uh, understanding the core differences in your opinion between short film storytelling and feature length storytelling. Let's start kind of just by making those uh, comparisons and contrasts so that we understand going forward through the rest of the question list. Anyone who wants to go first, just to jump right in. Mostly the length. <laughs> the <what? laughs> um. Right. So, but also, uh, true, true, Milan, the length is everything you're talking about, but it does, um, it's largely different. Short films are actually very difficult to do because you have a very small amount of time, thus the length. Um, whereas features, you end up with more time for setup, character development, and a lo longer arc. Um, and the other misconception often is that, oh, I did a short, so now I can do a lot of little shorts, and now it's a feature, but that doesn't work that way either. Yeah. You know, not every short is also meant to be a feature. So sometimes you have a short that does really, really well. And you have to be honest to say, do I have a character or a theme here that I can build into a feature? Um, is this really a proof of concept for something bigger? Or was it successful because I did the short form really, really well? Um, and often that's, you know, content wise, it's different. It doesn't mean that you can't use that as, as an inspiration for longer form content, but I think you just have to really be honest about why is your short successful and is it something that uh, merits developing into something longer like Jennifer was describing, what's, what's different about that? Well, I was wondering maybe if, that's a great segue, um, but I was wondering if too, one moment, um, I was wondering if too that you guys might uh, expand on that and go into the the understanding what is something what is a kind of story how do you recognize whether a story is viable uh, in a feature film format as as opposed to a short film format? Um, sorry, uh, you cut out for a second, so I couldn't hear what you were asking. You were asking what makes a story viable ver yes, short versus you feature. How do you tell the difference between uh, a story that's good as a short form and, and what, what makes, you know, what makes something viable for a feature film if it worked well in a short form, form film, at, how, film format, how can you tell what, what is viable for a feature length concept? I think um, one of the things is it has to, it can't be one note. So often with shorts, you want it to be a moment in time or you want it to be one, little like thing right one note but if, if that if it's only one note then it can't play the whole rest of the symphony right so you can't do an hour and a half or two hours on it and um and you start to feel that pretty quickly as you put it into a longer format you're like okay i'm still looking at the same thing even writing or or watching either one um so you do have to make sure that the content that there's somewhere to go in a feature you need you know character arcs you need story and theme arcs you need somewhere to go so 
that's one of the reasons shorts are actually very difficult in their own format is because they do the best ones are cap that capturing of of short format but it's also why features are harder mm -hmm. uh, because they just take more time not just to watch Milan but the actual time to do <laughs> <laughs> I well, think ask yourself what the conflict is in your short, right? And is that conflict resolved in your short in a way that you can't really sustain it through, you know, an hour and a half? In which case, like I was saying, it may not be that you have to throw the whole thing out, but it may be that you now need that character to go through something more dynamic, more extreme, raise the stakes. It can't be solved. And then, you know, just you're trying to fluff out 90 pages, you might have to raise the stakes for them for the longer format. Um, and, and if the conflict, which often to, to not feel like you're packing too much into a short, it's a smaller conflict, you're seeing how a character handles it and it gets resolved um, in a way that, that fits so nice for that little button at the end of your short. Um, so again, it's not that it can't turn into it, but but you have to really develop your idea beyond the short form. Yeah, and you know, I, this is a great segue because I want to push it over to Milan to kind of give uh, give a, a, an assessment in his experience. You know, these are all things that any uh, experienced film producer or or in, and even investor would be looking for when they're looking for a filmmaker who's coming out of the short space into the feature space for the first time. You know, Milan, what is it that the investor is looking for if somebody's coming and saying hey i have this great short am i going to turn it into a feature or or even a web series say what is a a a financer looking for uh a film filmmaker who may be new to the feature space uh, in, in order to have that confidence in them to tell a great story at the feature length level uh that it's a it's a great great question and i i'll, I'll I'll try to answer it uh, without going into stuff that I think we'll get into uh, later. I just think y when you feel like somebody has a confidence, like it's like, oh, they have a clarity of vision, something unique to say. That's that's a real opportunity with 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 short films because you know you have jurors from around the, the the country at film festivals checking these films out and. Nowadays, you have you can get all the equipment at a local Walmart, so there's no reason not to create. Not to create, so it's like we have an interesting industry where a lot a lot of people you just have to trust the person knows how to do their job. So now with a short film, it's like there somebody's ability to execute, and I just think that unique unique vision and that you you almost get a sense when you're watching a film that the director had a certain confidence in executing you know their vision whatever and uh that may be yeah and i would love to continue that conversation about um you know once you've found say a you know suitable um story that's that you feel is ready that process of going through and doing the the pitch elevating yourself out of a place where you know maybe you have done this uh, short film as a as a concept piece, or maybe it's just a proof of concept for your director that has as a director that has nothing to do with the feature that you're trying to create. Um, is is the short film a useful tool uh, for that purpose, or are there risks involved in associating a concept with something that's already been made? Um, are you potentially pigeonholing yourself into um, kind of a, a style or a uh, I guess for you know. Yeah, I don't know what I'm, I'm asking uh, beyond that, which is just how is a shoot short film used in the um, process of pitching and can it be a, a negative and, and not just a positive? I think that really depends. Um, today, it, it, I think that we shouldn't just be talking about features. I think we should also be including limited TV series, series, web series. So really, um, it really depends. I, I, as producers, we've we've been asked um, we've been asked for proof of concept. Sometimes that does happen. In which case, shorts are useful for that. Or if you're trying to prove a concept, especially in the genre like sci-fi and fantasy worlds, they're looking for a proof of concept to show that that idea is actually 
I can tell you one thing, putting it on a screen is different, right? So you have to make sure that that idea is communicatable on screen, like fantasy stuff or sci-fi stuff. Um, so th those are those are good things shorts are, are useful for, in my opinion. Um, they are also good for basically what Milan was saying a few minutes ago to show that filmmakers have a vision, to directors can direct, that the writing does work. All those things are important um, on their own as part of a pitch. Uh, I have also been told that, you know, they can be dangerous. So I think it depends on who you're pitching to and you got to know your audience in terms of who you're pitching to. Are you pitching to a producers? Are you pitching to uh, crowdfunding? Are you, what are you, you know, what are you doing with that short? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and that's actually a great segue into a question that's coming from the feed right now, which is, you know, what is the best way to find financing? How do you know what path to take? Um, and I can, I can say just uh, from a personal experience that I had recently in trying to find a home for a project, um, understanding that destination is super important, but it doesn't always work out. So how, how is it that you, what are the different ways that you could approach financing and how do you know which way is right for you? It, it, you know, that, that it's such a <laughs> tough question. Yeah. That's the million dollar question. <laughs> always, uh, you know, for me, if everything becomes about reverse reverse engineering, then what's 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 your goal? What's the right number, and how are you justifying that right number? The amount of times people are like, "Oh yeah, I need a million dollars," and it's like, do you really understand right. <laughs> for someone to write you a check or multiple people to write you a check for a million dollars? That is a lot of money. So I think having a justifiable business plan uh, that's that's where you know having a short with a proof of concept, you look back to films like Thunder Road that won the short one Sundance, then the film won South by, and then they did their own uh, thing. I'm actually going to share, uh, they did a whole Sundance creative distribution on uh, Thunder Road and how they, how they, how they did it. And it's a, it's a case study because they got money from Sundance creative distribution. So you have to show full transparency but you know, Whiplash was a Sundance winning short. Then it became the film. So, giving people, you know, that that comes down to business and your network. And of course, you know, sometimes on these panels, I'll say crowdfunding is dead. But I'm not. I'm not diminishing crowdfunding. I love Seed and Spark for film. But it when it comes that comes down to your community anyway, and you got to be an active part of the community to expect anything back, they say 80, 85% of the money on crowdfunding is people you already know. So it's not just people from all over hand it, trying to hand people money. So where to find financing, it comes down to network, like, you know, on the five to $10 million range, you can play the foreign sales game, which is changing, you know, by the month, uh, right. you know, and with theatrical in a flux and, you know, all the COVID things really the traditional ones that they teach people about aren't as available. And I think, you know, having people on your team that have been through it before that can make a compelling reason for why someone should have their, give you their hard earned money to have a chance at, you know, uh, make it, making money or they're a patron of the arts and that's okay if they know that up front. Sure. I think, I think this really comes to a point that I usually like to say during a panel is um, you need to know what you want from your film um, at any level, actually, but you need to know what you want from that film. Is this about um, proving you can do it? Like you just want to know, I know I made a feature or I made a short or whatever. Is it something, uh, a showpiece for yourself, which in which case you've got a different path for that. You're like, oh, I want people to know my name, that I made this, especially directors, often writers, sometimes actors. And you take it to festivals, you get to know people, you, you end up um, networking and that's what it's for. Um, or do I wanna make money? Because if you wanna make money, if you wanna return that investment, you're typically going to need a, a recognizable name in that film. And I hated hearing that forever when I was, but it's just the truth. It's just the truth. Um, not always. You do get some money back when you're just making stuff. Oh, you can also have the personal story, right? I, I need to tell this story. I need to personally go out there and tell this. Um, but those are the kind of the parameters that uh, we look at 
when we go to try to green light films that are being brought to us, like we want you to help us make this. It's always the first question we ask, why, what, what do you, why, what do you want from the film? Um, Cause that's going to change how you get the money. Right. So, so if you're going to have a name in it, someone recognizable that you don't know personally or doesn't live next door, then you're probably going to need more money to get them in it. Um, but if it's a personal story or something you want to take out there, then um, crowdfunding, uh, it, it works. It's worked for us. Um, and on top of that, you can always go the relative route because so we've we've done it that way, too. Um, if yeah. you've got a relative that has money. Jen, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would. Um, the thing, you know, the thing about crowdfunding is that it's also uh, it can be a test run for you on, um, you know, how good am I at at talking about my movie and getting people that even love and support me to jump on board? You know, it's practice too. at what are the ingredients to really understanding the movie I have on my hand? You know, what what uh what is going to sell that movie and starting to recognize that in every movie you make and build an audience. Cause the thing about crowdfunding is you're not just collecting money. You're collecting people that are excited about the brand you're building, you know, mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, what kind of films do I like to make? Why are they important to me? Why me? What, what's unique about me? Those are things that you're developing as you're making shorts and on, you know, tiny features, if that's what you decide to do as a next leap. And it just gives you that much more momentum to be able to then go into someone you do network with on that journey to say, hey, I have 2000 people behind me now because mm -hmm. I've grown my audience personally. Um, it's a ton of work, but it's all a ton of work. You know, you, you have to do that homework of first identifying what is my budget? What is a possible budget for this movie? And if you can't answer that question, you got to start talking to people, showing people your script, trying to compare to other movies that are like your movie, and then follow their journey. How did they raise their money? You know, your movie is not, is not going to follow the same path as even uh, the, multiple films by the same filmmaker. Each one's unique. So do you have anything you can compare it to, to know that you are on a realistic journey for your particular movie? Um, the other thing about raising money, I would say, especially as you're making a leap from shorts to features, is identify all the resources you have so that you can know what, you know, what do I really need to raise? Or can I write my movie a little bit more around the things I have, the locations I have, the people I have? Um, if I do have some connection to talent, can I write a movie around them so that there is a way to include them? You know, the collaborators that you already know that add to your production value and just make it easier for someone to say yes to you, whether that's through crowdfunding or through an industry connection that has a bigger checkbook. You want to give them reasons, more and more reasons to say yes. And that's homework. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. What I, I think what's really interesting is having the conversation about reverse engineering or even, uh, you know, and that can happen at several different points in the process, right? I mean, you could set out with a blank sheet of paper and say, you know, uh, what are the, you know, points that I want to hit there and make this movie marketable, right? You can also take it a step to the next step and say, well, I've got this idea. What do I have that's in this that's working? What can I change to make them more, um, to make them more appealing? Uh, maybe you could, could talk about that that process and the challenge of of you know I think a lot of filmmakers, especially ones that are new, have this concept that there's a preservation of the art, the way that they want to tell it in a specific way, and and it's important to have that, of course. But to to understanding the business side of show business as well as kind of their artistic uh, endeavors. So maybe you guys could comment on that a little bit. You're talking about the money versus vision kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and how to handle it, you know, as a strong, you know, business endeavor. I mean, at the end of the day, if you want to do this for a living, you've got to pull in dollars from a box office or a distrib distributor sale or whatever it is. Um, so maybe you guys could talk about how to find that balance and what, what things you might be able to tweak in a concept to make sure that it's sellable or that your pitch is solid. I think, I think that they, 
they have to go hand in hand. Um, you, and this goes back to the same question. What do you want the film or project to do? Um, what are your goals with it? Um, so if it's a high concept piece and you think you need more money, I, I, I agree with Milan, a lot of, a lot of filmmakers say I need a million dollars, but if, if you're not an experienced producer or line producer or someone who knows how to break out that money, you should probably talk to some because you may, you may not need a million dollars. You may need five. So it, 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 if you don't know, you should find some people who I, we're actually pretty friendly and out there. I know a lot of my filmmakers right here on this panel and all over Film Prize that are willing to talk to you and help you and give you advice. And that's my biggest advice in terms of money versus vision. You have the vision when you're when you're first starting out, have the vision, know what you want, and then talk talk to somebody about how to get that if you don't know money. Because money's important, <laughs> but you know, find, figuring out how to balance the two takes some experience in my experience. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody, anybody else want to comment on that? I think, I, you know, it, it's another, you know, all these questions are kind of ha hand in hand. So I'm trying not to, you know, step, step on other, other answers, but it's, too many people, you come through film school, you come through this and you, you go off what you see in theaters and then as indie filmmakers, they make lower budget versions of the four, the four quadrant studio model, trying to, trying to make men, women, old, young, all like it. But the reality is an indie film, if you try to make everyone happy, you're gonna make no one happy. So I call I call it really focusing on nailing your niche. You know, great examples like Moonlight and Parasite. Like just in the uh, few years, it, they just really know what they are. And if they're so great and exceptional, then it can cross over into the bigger audience. So from the script phase, really knowing, you know, who you are, what you are, what story you're trying to tell, and the audience you're trying to find. And if if Sometimes people, when people tell me in indie film that their audience is everyone, like our conversation's done. Like, <laughs> it's like, no, because, because that game is just as much done because of marketing dollars than it is quality of film. But big kudos to you, Chris, you know, this, this summer, your class action part, you know, like that outperformed so much of HBO's big budget titles right and and it, and it and it really knew what it was and it had fun with it and and you know you saw this summer you saw what what's his name joe exotic the tiger king you know right right next to the hundred million dollar extraction and outperformed it out you know yes there's no metrics because it's netflix but uh they've now introduced those metrics of top 10 and you you can do that now. It's if you're very specific, you know. Yeah. Well, and to that point, since you brought it up, I mean, Class Action Park, which is a, a documentary that um, I helped produce, that is now on HBO. Uh, it actually started off as a short documentary, and you know, it was one of those. Th it's, I'm hearing all the same things that you are talking about, Milan, and and it and Jennifer, which is finding that um, that core audience. You know, for us, it's like. Um, everybody that was in the Northeast had heard of this park in the set in the eighties and uh, how crazy or awful, or everybody has a story about how they broke their arm. And so there was this built in audience and then the internet had already kind of caught on to this, um, subject. And, you know, when HBO, the HBO discussions were happening early on, it was, you know, even then it was like, prove your, um, prove your audience before we make this, you know, uh, a final deal. And there was a lot of, um, effort to kind of present the the base that was there and of course we now know that it was a it was a success but you know even for what seems like now to be a an obvious uh you know top film there was a lot of proving that had to go on there sure. um, even in the documentary space so um i do want to kind of there seems to be some comments in the in the chat going on that kind of lean around a theme and i want to kind of address it because the question is, you know, what is it that people are looking for in a short film to prove you as a filmmaker? And I wonder if uh, maybe there's another way to kind of turn the cube, um, because I think that that may be one side of a coin, but to, but to help the under filmmakers understand too, 
what somebody is looking for is not just in their short, but in who they are and how they are approaching their business um, and themselves as a, as a product or a brand. And so maybe you guys could address the direct question, which is what people are looking for in a, in a short um, to move to a feature or to a series, and then uh, turn that on its head and kind of talk about the other aspects that somebody might be looking for in the filmmaker. <laughs> that's a bit, that's a large question really um, in terms of how to answer it. Um, I think um, in terms of sh in terms of shorts and and it depends on which position you're in too. So if we're talking about directors, you know most of us uh, on this panel have had, well, I think all of us, being producers, we, we've we seen a lot of different things. We've had uh, people ask us to come on board their films. If they are sending me shorts to look at, I am going to look at the quality of not only the content, which I wanna know that it says something, that it's it has a point of view, um, but also the quality of it, you know, if it's got terrible sound, you'd be surprised how much that's a true thing. Terrible sound, that's a big uh, a big no-no to me, or you know, it's shot in the dark and you can't see it, or any of those kinds of things. Some production value does matter. Mostly what matters the most if it's a director, because you're aware the directors are, are reliant on their teams for some of those production value things. It really is going to be vision and, and directing. We do know what directing good directing is, so we do know how to see it. Um, and again, that point of view and commitment to their their own product um, in terms of looking what I'm looking for in a short specifically. I'm gonna have to think about the rest of what you said. Sure, does anybody else <laughs> wanna take a, take a stab while she's thinking? Sure, I mean, one really important quality to me to identify is if there's something inauthentic that comes across about their filmmaking. So by that, I mean, you know, their approach to performance or content, you know, or just uh, the script itself, if they've chosen material that somehow has something that reads as being, um, being, you know, inauthentic to the community it represents or to the character, mm. um, are they getting truthful moments out of their performers? Um, you know, you can get away with a little bit in a short that you would not be able to get away with in a longer project. Um, but I'm really looking at, you know, beyond production value, you know, am I getting moved by this story um, because of the way that they've put it together? Um, do they understand pacing? Do they understand how to let moments breathe? Like, is the story punctuated um, emotionally? Like, those sorts of things. And I, I, I tend to feel like, you know, that reads to me with the producer and the director, you know, they mm -hmm. both are responsible for making sure those things happen. Um, so, um, and that, that doesn't matter how much money you have. Although I would argue that if you try to do something over ambitious, you're not going to give yourself the space to really um, focus on those storytelling aspects, you know, you're going to be so rushed that we won't be able to see how well you can design a shot. We won't be able to see that you take your time with the actors and are able to find the truth of the most emotional moments because you were so harried or you didn't have enough, you know, um, time in the day or whatever. Um, so, you know, and that, and that is also what I center any interview I have uh, with a filmmaker on. They better be able to talk from an authentic place with the specific film, but also about what kind of films they want to make, who they want to be and what they want to do next. You know, um, if they haven't put a lot of thought into that, then they haven't made enough stuff on their own before they're ready to talk to collaborators. Which speaks to the branding of themselves. Yeah. yeah and, and I, for me, both of them, it's, it's two separate goals. On a feature, the goal is to make money. On a short is to prove that your, you know, your ability to execute. And, you know, I've seen shorts that are eight minutes long that feel like they're three hours long. And it, there's an efficiency of storytelling, get in, get out. You oftentimes just getting into the film and that first line of dialogue 
on a, on a short, you're like, all right, I'm in good hands. And, you know, I saw an incredible short. I was a juror for uh, Jim Brunzel, who was uh, a panelist earlier, a glyph. I saw in it, it and it won uh, one of the competitions. It was three minutes long. You know, it competed against 18 minute, 15 minute, but it, it had a whole three act structure in, in three minutes. And it was like, it was as a juror, it was almost like a relief too to see, Oh, I can watch that in three minutes. And I found myself wanting to watch it again. You know, I reached out, I had Jim send me the filmmaker's email and that's where shorts is your ability when you may not have access to the full resources if you get into any festival and, and the festival and the regional festival circuit is, is, is often overlooked, you know, a lot of people's strategy is Sundance or bust, but that's mm -hmm. not a real, you know, strategy. Look, look at who the jurors are and this, and you can really get seen from outside of, you know, you don't have to be in New York or LA anymore. I'm, I'm in, I, I, I'm in Chattanooga, Tennessee now after, you know, 15 years in, LA, but, uh, so it's like, but my goal, my goals are different between the two. So it's hard it, because I'm, I, I don't know how to monetize a short. So as a producer, I've never, I've never done one, but to find writers, directors, actors, what a great place. So it, it kind of depends what your role is. I think Jennifer mentioned that, uh, earlier as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's interesting because it rolls into another question that a filmmaker has brought up, which is, um, kind of turning that cube again and saying, okay, if you're a filmmaker and you're being approached about doing someone's project, say somebody saw short and loved your your vision or your style and, and wants to bring you onto their project as a creative force, um, what should a filmmaker be looking for in those collaborators uh, so that they are able to um, preserve their brand and their, their person while also taking advantage of opportunities that may be at their door? Can I ask what position you're talking about, Chris? Uh, like, this this person as a is director? a director. Yeah. Okay. As a director, I you know this is a really tough tough question. Uh, as a yes, look looking at a producer, look what they've done before. IMDb and IMDb Pro is your friend. Like so look, you can look around, and it's a small industry. You can ask about that person. The early conversation. I never when I come across like people randomly, I, I ne I'm never pitching a project at first. First, I'm listening what they're about. That'll tell you a lot of the story. You know, that the other part of that, how do you preserve your artistic integrity? It's, it's very tough because that's that's, that can become a point of contention. If you're not bringing money to the table, if, if I have experience monetizing films, so sometimes in the contract we'll put stuff in like, okay, because everybody wants final cut. And, and it's just <laughs> like, but it's like, okay, well, if it's between 80 and 110 minutes and, you know, I, I, recently into contracts, if I'm giving a close version of final cut, it's, it's got to be between 80 and 110 minutes. And if we don't say our goal is Sundance, if we don't get into Sundance South by Tribeca, then I get then I get to get into it or I get Milan's it, cut. <laughs> if it doesn't get into TIFF and, you know, so many films, you know, that I've, I, I, it's, it's like another cut, another version. It's like, trust your collaborators too. It really does take a village. And I, and I, and I see people like it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. It's like no film looks like, yes, you hear the stories of Chris Scorsese and Jim Cameron, but guess what? You're not them. And, 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 and right now it's like, if all that money goes away, well, that, that producer that raised it for you, they can't raise money again. So they have a lot more on the line. The director, you know, you see the directors and the actors and the writers go from that Sundance film to the hundred million dollar film. The producers don't get that. So no, they don't. trust, <laughs> and, and that's fine. That's not what we signed up for, but that, so trust trust and get to know your collaborators but if i've i've walked away from tons of projects when i get that energy that it's their vision and not a word is changing not a frame is changing i'm 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 out before 
before we even get to talking about financing or that, because it really does take a, this is a very collaborative art. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to to your brand. And so obviously Milan's saying, your personal brand now we're talking about, not just what you make, but Milan just said, you know, if I get that vibe from you, I mean, that's a real vibe out there, you guys. And it's, it's for real. Uh, you know, filmmaking is a team sport and you better know how to be a good team player. And that being said, you should also protect yourself. You should meet with this person. You should do your homework on IMB, IMDb, watch their movies, because that will give you some ideas. Um, and then also meet with them, talk to them, and see what you're vibing off of them. Because there's also a bunch of producers out there that think they know everything, and they only want you to come on board so that they can direct through you. You know, there's, I mean, you just got to – gotta interview them like you would anybody else, any other kind of job, you know, and in the end, Milan's also right. If they are, have raised all the money, you know, you're going to have to, you're going to have to be thankful that they want to hire you to make their movie. Um, because if they've got the money, it's both of your movies. It's not just yours anymore. I would be honest about your own strengths and weaknesses and know what criticisms have you gotten about the way you work in the past as a director? If, if any, you know, what are the things that have made you incompatible with someone in the past? Like any relationship, you know, hit those head on and make sure that you're not going to repeat old patterns. So find someone that's compatible with you. Uh, and it doesn't mean that, you know, one's bad and one's good, but you've got to find matches that are going to set you up for success and set them up for success. So, you know, don't be in denial about things that are hard about you in the way you work in preserving your vision, you know, what are those things? Um, or what are you resistant to? Do you resist a 12 hour day? You better not come on my set. You know, I, I have very specific things as a producer that are gonna be deal breakers, you know, that may not work for every director and vice versa. Um, so, you know, do you value the actor's space as a producer? Are you gonna protect that? If you don't get that, if then we're not simpatico if I'm the director. You know, there are things that you need to know what's that list for yourself. Um, and then use those questions too when you're asking references. So definitely talk to another director if they've produced multiple things. Email that director and say, hey, what were they like to work with? You know, you might not get the total truth, but you you'll get something and if they loved it, they'll certainly tell you that. Um, so I think I think getting references is great and not just to find out if they're good or bad, just, you know, um, what are they like? Is it gonna work with you? And also if you get that vibe of any kind that gives you a red flag, that is gold. Accept that and, and trust it because, um, those vibes are real and they only get more intense as the process goes. It's years Amen. of work. It's people's money. It's people's livelihood. You know, it's not worth working with jerks. <laughs> yeah. And where would be the fun in that? And, um, you know, at the end of the day, we want to all enjoy what we do and, and not that that always happens to be perfect every time, but you certainly and want it to be as, as often as you can control. Um, so I wanted to, uh, by the way, and I, I know that this is probably getting put in the comments, but they had some questions about what, uh, what's the name of the short film that uh, Milan was referring to, and it's called Birds of a Feather. Uh, it's an LGBTQ plus animated short, so um, I'm not sure if it's available to watch online, but I bet there's information out there about it, right, Milan? Okay, yeah. he's nodding yes. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to kind of move to um, another topic here that's kind of more on the um, logistics side of making features, especially nowadays. And um, what the, I think we are all acutely aware of the, the generic um, challenges that working in the COVID um, times may present to filmmakers. A lot of these filmmakers have already experienced uh, some of that uh, in preparation for this festival. Um, but as we're moving forward in this time, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate about content availability uh, who's able to produce things, and I was wondering if you guys might give some thoughts on where things may be headed in terms of the search for content uh, as far as distribution uh, or sales would go. This, this is a great question, much like the financing question, the million dollar <laughs> thing. It, 
There's a big mis misnomer out there, though. Everyone thinks, oh, they're going to need tons of content. Therefore, anything you make is going to find a home. That's not going to happen. It's it's more competitive than ever. Netflix is not your savior. Like, you know, you just saw Netflix in the last couple of weeks. They picked up a $30 million Zendaya film. Uh, well, it wasn't made for that. They paid $30 million, $20 million for a Halle Berry boxing film that premiered at venice and then another uh somebody else uh apple picked up a movie for 40 million it's still star star based so uh it you've got to focus on quality and you've got to focus you know it, it stinks when you hear it but jennifer ref referenced it earlier like the first question you're going to ask is who's in it you know i i do think in general like the, the one to two million dollar typical Sundance drama right now is a very dead dead space uh, on acquisitions, but also physically producing it. You know, you asked about logistics. I think you either have to go very small, mm -hmm. shoot something out that's one location, limited characters, doesn't take place over too many. Uh, I did, I've done two films during COVID and, and one in real life and shot that one was shot in less than a week. And it stars two Netflix stars, uh, including like Devin Druid, who was in uh, who was in Thirteen Reasons Why and Greyhound with Tom Hanks, and and uh, it's a Christmas movie. It's called White Elephant. Christmas movie. Last year there were 140 Christmas movies that played. So my theory here was there's going to be less that are made this year. So I'm trying to fit a very specific thing. The other one, we sent rigs to all these actors' houses and we shot over the course of, you know, with a, with a tripod and an iPhone 11 on the and Filmic Pro app. But that one, we have Sarah Levy of Schitt's Creek, Alan Tudyk, Jim O'Hare of Parks and Rec. It's, a, it's another, it's a, soci, it's a quarantine comedy, but we're answering that question. Otherwise, you've got to go up in budget because... Just to, you know, Jurassic Park, they're spending $9 million on COVID. I've been on all these COVID calls. To, to, it's 10 to 30% of your budget and to be able to afford it. And if you're a union show, it's just almost impossible. To, be, safety's not negotiable. Low budget, high budget, it's always your first priority. It's not, if you can't keep people safe, your project's not worth it. So... These are tough, you know, so I had to strip away those comforts and it's like, okay, we're, this is what we're going to do. But just to think that it's it because there's going to be this need, because now people are shooting in Canada, they're shooting in New Zealand, they're shooting in Australia with big stars. That's what's going to fill it. My, and my fear is all these conversations about diversity from women to uh people of color to LGBTQ is that barrier to entry is actually going to get even higher in the short term because of these smaller projects, not being able to find that, that, that proper home. So the festival circuit will still be important, but um, yeah, that, sorry, that was a, a big coverage. Like uh, I, I hear that question a lot that, and people just think, well, they're going to need tons of content. So we're going to have that. And it's like, no, it's like, yeah. they're, they're, they're pickier than ever. Yeah. And it's, think, it's certainly something that I, I feel has been a lot of discussions that I've had with friends too. Sorry, Jennifer, did I interrupt you? No, no, no. I think that, um, that was a great, actually broad answer there Milan, covering a lot of subjects. No, in a good way. I'm serious. Um, I think, you know, we're getting the asked the same thing. Um, typically we do, smaller level budgets. Um, I ha I'm involved with a film right now that's just waiting because, you know, this period's not going to be forever. The industry is going to be there. Um, you know, they, they estimated that, you know, their line item for COVID right now would be about 30 grand, which is probably a third of their budget. So they're just they're just doing everything else they can. They're developing it more. They're uh, prepping the hell out of it, which you should do anyway, especially on the, well, everybody should prep. Um, um, and that's, that, that doesn't, COVID doesn't affect that because you can prep from your computer, from your home in zooming, you know, you can protect everybody and, and look, safety is absolutely the most important thing. And 
you know, that also ends up your producers that and other producers that you're going to be looking for are going to be taking a big pause. You know, they the general liability insurance that producers hold right now uh, for this year anyway, you know, they've literally said, yeah, we don't cover COVID. That's not in there. And the next time you renew, you're going to have to sign a waiver saying we don't cover it because liability is a real thing too on the business side. So of course I don't want anyone to get sick, but you also need to understand what you're risking. If you are producing anything during COVID, if someone gets sick and God forbid dies, you know, that's, that's on you because you're the workplace. So you need to be really, really careful what you're out there putting together and make sure that everybody is safe for, for both reasons. First off, you don't want to kill anybody. And you also don't, you gotta, you gotta remember that no film, no project, nothing is more important than taking care of people. And that goes to back to the team play, you know, it's, and it's going to be there. It, it, they, all of these things are being talked about right now from, you know, $10 budgets all the way up to the millions. You know, they're all discussing this exact same thing and procedures are happening. Things are moving forward. You know, is there a content race right now? No. Um, it's nice because some of these uh, actors are a bit more, a little more available. They're happy to have you send rigs to their homes and things like that. Great job, Milan. That's cool. Um, right. But um, I wouldn't feel pressured. The industry will be there next year and the following year. I would work on what you want to do and all these other things we're talking about. It's the same exact thing. It's just got a big old problem outside there but producers are dealing with these problems and all kinds of problems all the time and keeping it small anyway if you're if you're if you're like okay well i have a bunch of friends and we're just going to make a feature keeping it small anyway is the way to go especially if you don't have a lot of experience on the team you know keep it under four actors keep it to two locations you're going to want to do that anyway the other problem that we see a lot in our company is they turn in a script and it literally has 37 actors and 26 locations in it and the budget's, you know, 100, 200 grand. And you're like, okay, well, let's talk about this. Each line item alone is, is crazy. Every time you have an actor, it's 12 to 15 pieces of paper and, a, and money, money. Yeah. So, Jen, and did I you love have actors. To add? I, <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that was a great answer, too. And I, yeah. I love those answers. I wholeheartedly agree. I would add that um, uh, during this time, though, I think, you know, um, it's worth thinking about forms that are COVID safe that you might have material for that you might be able to use either just to keep creating, maybe build some connections. Maybe there's an actor you would love to someday cast, give them a low pressure way to work with you. That means that now they're ready, they're primed for you asking them to do that feature. So there's something you can do with them remotely that doesn't take that much of their time but that lets them get to know you and trust you and make you feel you know make them feel like I want to work I want to support this filmmaker yeah I want to do that project in a year or two years you know um the um I was just on a webinar call with the uh with Mark Duplass where he was talking about um some great advice that I'm passing on and sharing if you weren't on that um which was to think about things like narrative podcasting, you know, a serial narrative that you can do with um, just your phone and the actor's phone and a little light in their own space that you could actually put together the entire thing with good sound. Um, and that could be a template, that could be proof of concept for something, you know, that you're getting ready to build momentum for. Or um, documentary that you have a lot of found footage for that all you need to do is add some interviews for um, which you can do remotely and build a little short something you know again building trust with maybe a subject you want to expand on something you know um, I thought both of those things he had to recommend were really like oh yeah that's that seems that seems appropriate for a way to keep momentum going in your creative life and not compromising anybody's safety in this moment Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're coming toward the, the end of our time together, but um, so I wanted to kind of bring us back to uh, the shorts to feature kind of uh, conversation and think about, you know, what that strong piece of advice is that you would give to a filmmaker um, as they're looking to kind of shift their perspective from maybe the focus that they've had on, a, on a, the project that they've done for Film Prize, say, 
and turn toward looking at a, at a career um, and moving out of the space where they are concerned with the day-to-days of production and, and looking at how they can become better, um, better prepared as a, as a product and a brand themselves, as you guys have put it. Um, it's been a really wonderful conversation, but I wanted to just give you each three the opportunity to drop that solid piece of advice uh, on our filmmakers. And uh, I know that there'll be other opportunities for filmmakers to interact with you guys. So uh, throw it out there and let's see what uh, the filmmakers have to say about it. Uh, give it a shot. Uh, without, without going too much into what we've spoken about today, I, I think, you know, be, be, be it a positive a part of the community. That's so important. So embrace your big festivals and embrace your regional festivals, getting to know people. In the end, the amount of people that have gotten work by the fact that it's like, oh, I like this person, I trust this person. So I think, you know, our whole indie film is just like one, one fragile eco ecosystem. And, and it's not a competition for me to win. I don't need you to, you to lose. It's not binary. So I think supporting other people's films in, a, in whatever capacity, we, we need to be better as a community doing that. So I think, and you know, Twitter has become such a great way to download information of, and become a part of the conversations. It doesn't matter where you are. And, you know, I, I've found one project off Twitter over the pandemic, and I found uh, two writers on development projects off like call, social media calls this this summer. So it's like as bad as social media can be nowadays, it can actually be a great asset to still connect and treat that as an integral part of your job. So I guess, it, you know, it, instead of just the filmmaking is understand the whole 360 business. It's a relationship business. Absolutely. Jen. That's great advice. I love that. Um, it made me think of something that I've, I've started doing, which it encourages that in myself, which is, you know, no matter how much money you have or don't have, you can be a patron of the arts and support your community. And so I make it a habit to find a couple projects each month that I can throw a couple bucks at in crowdfunding. It helps me connect with those people. Now I'm following their projects. It keeps me in tune with, you know, where that, those project, projects end up. So it helps kind of with your education piece, but it's good energy. And it and it's, um, I, I love that. I think that's a really um, great piece of advice to be part of the community. You know, I would say that, um, I think, I think that uh, you have to not be waiting to become a filmmaker. You have to think, I am a filmmaker at a certain part, point on my journey, but that means that you also can't wait to be ready if someone did hand you that money, you know, what would you be making? Um, and uh, and what, what are you making with what you have at the moment? I think, I think the more you wait, the more you start to doubt yourself as an artist, as a filmmaker, as a professional, you start to feel like a hobbyist, you know, um, you start to believe that you're not uh, maybe worthy of the attention that you're, you're ultimately hoping to get. Um, so I think that, you know, deeming yourself worthy and, and backing it up with that homework of constantly generating um, fun and playful content that's in your wheelhouse. Um, uh, and then sharing it, sharing the heck out of it. When you get that short, you do well with this, this particular festival or any festival, don't just wait for the phone to ring or an email to come. You've got to then keep that hustle going and be back out with that community. But guess what? Because you took Milan's advice. Now you have all these people to share it with because you've been part of the community and they want to watch your movie because you watch theirs. Win, win. Yay. <laughs> right. There's a lot of nodding heads back here. And I mean, it is, it's 100% true as, um, you can't think of yourself as a silo. You have to think of yourself as a member of the community and, and be active in the um, building of your own future. Uh, Jennifer, take us home. Thanks. Um, I obviously agree with the community thing. Um, not only is it a good idea, but it's really fun. Um, it's a good way to go through the, the 
trauma and drama going on out in the world. It's nice to connect with other creatives and and coming off of what Jen just said in terms of you guys watch films, watch other people's film, watch big films, watch little film. Makers are that'll help you know what you like. Learn what you like, learn what you want. So um, especially in these times where we do have to really fight for more inclusion um, and more content that is better suited to rep for representation, especially with stuff going overseas because America hasn't decided to be quite safe enough at the moment. These are the times that this, this is a community-based situation and you honing what you want to do and how you want to represent that right now is one of the best uses of your time that you can do. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for this sage advice. Uh, and thank you all for the filmmakers and the audience members who have tuned in uh, to watch this live panel discussion. A couple of quick reminders as we are uh, exiting the show today, which is uh, we have a uh, broadcast, a prize cast live at 6 p.m. tonight. And that's going to kind of wrap up what we've seen so far and what's been going on. And then at nine o'clock PM, we have our free screening of Shaun of the Dead, which is just a communal screening. There'll be a chat going. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, more panel discussions tomorrow at 2 PM uh, right here on the social media channels and then also on prizefest.com. So we're looking forward to seeing you all join us there. Uh, until then, uh, Viva the Film Prize. You guys want to do a big Viva the Film Prize as we uh, go out? Let's uh, change it over here. I'm like two. All right, we can see everybody on screen now. Okay, on three, you ready? One, two, three. Viva, Viva Lou Fantastic, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon.